Genesis 6.4 itself, I maintain, doesn't even support the idea of multiple incursions. So just read the text. It says, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days. What days? Well, if you continue reading in all the other supporting texts, the days of Jared. And also after that, when is that? The days of Jared. When the sons of God, who are the angels, came unto the daughters of men, when? In the days of Jared. And they bare children to them. The same who were born in the days of Jared were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The word old comes from the Hebrew word olam, which is translated very often about 100 plus times as forever and or everlasting. So nothing about Genesis 6-4 even remotely supports the idea that we're talking about angels coming back again after the flood. Um, so I, after I'm looking at this text and realize after the first incursion, 3550 BC, 500 years later, that those children are all dead. Well, we still got you know, another 700 years or so to go to get to the flood. I realized that there was actually a pre-flood return of the Nephilim, but didn't come about as a result of angels mating with women. When you take the ancient texts and you synchronize them together, again, I don't have time to go through all this. You can see it on the board. Um, the text in black is the Genesis text, and the text in red is the supporting text. You see the breakdown of events, how everything took place, what happened when, and we see in Genesis uh, chapter 6, verses 8 through 10, that Noah was genetically pure. Now, his wife, according to the extra biblical text, was the daughter of, of Enoch. So we know Enoch was a good guy, right? He was so righteous, God took him, right? So good pick for a wife, for Noah. So if Noah and his wife are genetically pure, it stands to reason then that his sons, his three sons are pure too, right? Everybody with me? No mention of angels. Noah, his wife, and his three sons are pure. Who's left? That's all you have left. Occam's razor, right? When you have competing ideas, the one that requires the least amount of assumptions, probably the right one. Well, and the wives don't even show up until uh, verse 18. Verse, chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 says, All flesh became corrupted. How much is all? all? With the exception of those who are genetically pure to the verses prior, right? Because those are singled out. These guys are pure. Wives aren't mentioned until verse 18. Quick quiz. Does 18 become before or after 12? After. after. Right. Okay. So I want to unpack Genesis 6, 12, because it says that all flesh should become corrupted. Well, the extra biblical text of Joshua goes into a whole lot more detail and tells you that how they became corrupt is they began to blend species together. They began to blend animals and plants and reptiles and fish and birds and people. It, the corruption of all flesh came as a result, not of angels mating with women, but as a result of blending species. Well, guess what we're doing today? Blending species. Ah, now Yeshua said in Matthew 24, 37, that the last days would be like the days of Noah not the days of Jared. The days of Jared were angels mating with women. The days of Noah, especially specifically the last 120 years leading up to the flood, were all about genetic modification. Also confirmed in Jubilee 724. And this is a recap. This is after the flood. Noah's kind of giving a recap of what happened that led to the flood. The angels mating with women and all that stuff. And he says, and after this. The after this is in a pre-flood context. The after this of Jubilee 724 is the after that of Genesis 6-4. They sinned against the beasts and the birds and all that moveth and walketh on the earth, and much blood was shed on the earth, and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. It became, the violence was a byproduct of the blending of species. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Taking that diagram that I had up there earlier and expanding it a little bit, uh, to the last 120 years leading up to the flood, that's when the, what I call the end, also after that latter day corruption of all flesh took place. And, and Part of what, uh, what I'm looking at there is, I believe, defined for us in Genesis 6.3. Genesis 6.3 talks about God saying that my spirit's no longer going to dwell with you. For man is flesh and he has 120 years, right? Well, a lot of people take the 120-year thing there in Genesis 6.3 and spin it off into jubilees and all kinds of stuff. Well, you know, it's interesting that, you know, 120 jubilees would be 6,000 years. That's cool. But that has nothing to do with Genesis 6.3. Genesis 6.3 is not talking about jubilees. It's talking about, hey, if you guys don't knock off, if you don't knock it off, this activity that you're doing, a blending species and genetically modifying all the kinds that I set apart and said everything must re reproduce after what? Its own kind. If you guys don't knock it off, you're, you're messing up my house. He created us to be what? The temple of what? The Holy Ghost. He created us in the image and likeness of himself. He created a like body for him to inhabit. 
if you start blending species into your body and jacking up your house, he's like, he's saying, hey, you better knock it off. I'm not going to be able to hang out with you anymore because you're not looking like the image and likeness that I created you to be. That's what's going on right there. I got T-Rex in there. I, I personally believe T-Rex was a genetically modified dinosaur. I believe dinosaurs did coexist with man. Uh, but I think when we're talking about the dinosaurs that God created, I believe we're talking about the uh, herbivore class dinosaurs. You know, and then they started blending species together, and I think we ended up with you know, Velociraptor and T-Rex and stuff like that. While I was kind of formulating all these theories in my head, I had these two books sitting on my desk arranged in the order that you see up there on the screen. Doug Hamp's book on the left, Corrupting the Image, and Tom Anita Horn's book, Forbidden Gates on the right. Just both of them sitting on the desk, and I'm like, wow, is that the formula? Is the formula... When you corrupt the image that God originally created and the like kinds that he originally created and called good, you start corrupting that, does it open up forbidden gates that bring about the creation of Nephilim? I believe, yes, that's exactly what happens. And if you look at the word Nephilim, it's derived from the word Nephal. Most people say the word means to fall or the fallen ones. Well, that's true. It's one of the definitions. But there's a bunch of other definitions for the same word, like to be judged. And I think when you start messing around with God's stuff, you're going to get judged. You know, that's what's going to happen. Basically, I define Nephilim as that which has fallen from the original state or the kind that God created. And again, while I was thinking about these things, the movie Spider-Man came out. And it was the movie, uh, the, the Spider-Man movie, where uh, his, his enemy was the lizard. And if you've seen the movie, the, 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 the scientist, he was a good guy. He was missing part of his arm. You know, he, he lost it in, in combat. And uh, he decided, you know, what is the code that allows you to chop off the tail of a lizard and it grows back? What's the regeneration code? So he starts cutting the legs off of mice and rats and stuff like that and t tinkering with the DNA until finally he gets a combination that works. And then one of the mice grows its leg back and he's like, ah, I figured it out. Eureka, right? So he injects himself with the same formula and his arm grows back. That's awesome. But he had an unfortunate side effect in that he became a giant lizard man that had only evil continually in his heart and mind for the rest of the movie. I'm like, man, Hollywood gets it. You know, the church is still fighting about the Sethite theory, but they're showing a guy who's a normal, good guy who starts blending himself with other DNA, and the result was having only evil continually in his heart and mind in addition to becoming a giant lizard man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's exactly what was taking place. And so then that brings us to the post-flood return of the Nephilim. Of course, we have the flood take place, you know, and, and then after the flood, the giants are there right away. You know, so whether you believe what I'm talking about or you believe the angels came down and made it with women, the net result is exactly the same. You still have giants after the flood. Either way, the net result is exactly the same. Uh, but I think the smoking gun that obliterates the whole idea of multiple incursions is the same guy, Moses, who wrote Genesis 6, also wrote the rest of the book and the rest of the Torah. And he wrote in Genesis chapter 9, just three chapters later, verse 18 and 19, he says, The sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Why did he just insert that there? Oh, no, by the way, Ham is the father of Canaan. Who were the Israelites always having to deal with in the land? The Canaanites. Who were the ones that they were consistently told to utterly destroy? Kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, wipe out everything. Don't even eat the food until the third or fourth generation of produce. Canaanites. Ham is the father of Canaan. <laughs> Not an angel. Right there. And if you still didn't get it, verse 19, it says, These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole world overspread. Other translations say populated. The whole earth was populated by these three guys. No mention of angels anywhere in the picture. So when you look at the breakdown of, the, of their offspring, Ham, by far, has some very interesting kids. Uh, there are many giants in the offspring of Canaan, obviously the Canaanites we talked about. There's at least one in Mitzrayim's line, uh, that being Kaftor. None that I could find and put, uh, and one in Cush, but I don't believe he was born that way. I believe he did something to modify himself and became that way, and that would be Nimrod. Uh, the Amorites are mentioned over 80 times in your Bible. Amorites are described by the book of Amos as being as tall as cedar trees. They come from Canaan, son of Ham, no mention of angels. And the Philistines are mentioned over 200 times, and they come from Kaftor, son of Mitzram, son of Ham, no mention of angels anywhere. Uh, 
So, and we know of at least a few famous Philistines, right? Goliath and his brothers. Yeah. So clearly something's going on there. There's no giants anywhere in the line of Shem that I could find anyway. That's a good thing. Who come from Shem? Yeshua comes from Shem. Right. So he's, that line's pure. And there, yeah, right, son of man, pure, genetically pure. Um, and there's some in Japheth. Now, you won't get this in Scripture. You won't find this information in Scripture. If you look through history, however, just do a Google search on Gog and Magog plus giant. And you'll see that all throughout history, many different cultures understood that Gog and Magog were giants. In fact, every year to this day, they still have a parade. It still takes place even today where they march these two giant statues through the streets of the U.K., it's called the Lord Mayor Parade. The Lord Mayor Parade was created and was founded by King John Lackland, the signer of the Magna Carta, who, by the way, all of our presidents just so happen to be related to. It's just a coincidence. Just a coincidence, right? I mean, what would the statistical odds be if we have presidents of the people, for the people, by the people, like we are all taught and brainwashed to believe, that they would all be related, not just to each other, but to the guy who created the Nephilim Parade that they still have every year? <laughs> Call me crazy, but I don't think your votes matter. <laughs> That's another lecture <laughs> that deals with deception. You want to decode deception? There's a little piece of it for you right there. I stood on the Great Wall of China when I was a missionary. I was in China. And um, you see all these little people? I mean, that, that wall is huge. In fact, there's a new, uh, I think it's a Matt Damon movie coming out. <laughs> it's called The Wall, where, I, at least from the previews, it looked very interesting. It's like, you know, they're, they're, they're fighting something. They don't really show what it is. And, like, this big hand comes and starts yanking people off the wall and stuff like that. I mean... I don't know what the movie is going to be about, but it looks like they understand this, the reason why that wall was built. When you see that thing, it is so huge. It is massive overkill if you're just trying to keep out six-foot-tall invaders. If you're trying to keep out the hordes of Gog and Magog, on the other hand, well, that makes a lot more sense. In fact, there was a Geico commercial that actually showed that. You ever see that Geico commercial? They had these, like, Mongolian-looking guys that come up on the Great Wall of China. It's, like, this tall. And they're looking at it like, mm, what do we do? <laughs> And the other guy looks at him, he just steps over and he's walking on. I'm like, even Geico gets it, you know? When I was, when I was uh, at the Great Wall of China, I found out that one of the original names for the Great Wall of China was called the Ramparts of Magog. The Ramparts of Gog and Magog. So, j -Path apparently had some giants in his line as well. When you look at the, uh, the lineage, specifically of Ham in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20, and you get one of those uh, books, that, there's a really good book called the, A Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names by J.B. Jackson. The whole book is just all the names in the Bible and the corresponding meaning of their names. All right, if you look up the names of, of the people in, in Ham's lineage in Genesis 10, 6 through 20, I mean, look at the, look at the meaning of their names. All right? uh, proud parents, you guys raised your hands earlier. What would possess you to turn to your spouse after you just have your, your newborn baby and say, enclosure of wrath, what do you think, honey? <laughs> <laughs> or terror, <laughs> or blades, or, you know, wh why would you name your kid something like that unless there's something clearly wrong with that kid? Now, you may name your teenager terror later, <laughs> but <laughs> the babies. Clearly, something's going on with these kids. Well, yeah, all of the post-flood Nephilim trace back to these guys. These are the ones that they're told to utterly destroy. Uh, and we have scriptures such as Deuteronomy 20, 17 to look at, to point to for what I just said. It says, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Well, what do you know? Those are the same people that show up in Genesis chapter 10, verses 15 through 18, with no mention of angels anywhere. What do you know? And again, Genesis 9 says, Ham's the father of Canaan. These guys populated the whole world. In the post-flood world, this is a conservative scale, I think. Um, you know, you have a normal six-foot-tall person on the left here. Goliath is somewhere between 9 and 12 feet tall, depending on who you read, regarding the cubit and all that. Uh, Og of Bashan is typically understood to be somewhere between 15 and 18 feet tall. And the Anakim, the early Canaanites that made the Hebrew spies feel like grasshoppers, I believe are in the 24 to 36 foot realm being conservative. Again, cedar trees, the cedars of Lebanon are 150 feet tall. So when they're saying they're as tall as the cedars, were they referring to the cedars of Lebanon? I don't know, but just going erring on the small side, that's what you're looking at in the post-flood world. And when you understand that, I think we have to rethink some of the scriptures and some of the passages and some of the characters that we're familiar with in the, in the Old Testament, like Abraham. 
We think of Abraham as typically this kind of frail old guy with the long beard, Father Abraham, right? Uh, I'm thinking, you know, yeah, he eventually got that way, but I think this is probably a better <laughs> idea of something like, you know, early Abraham, you know, before he became that frail old guy. Uh, because when you start reading, uh, like, the Genesis 14 war, that's a crazy war right there. That, that war is Lord of the Rings territory, all right? You just go through and read that. Uh, it's the four kings against the five kings, and the four kings beat the five kings and chased them all into the slime pits, which later became the uh, um, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, all the whole thing right there. Um, it, it says Lot was taken. Lot and his family were, were captured as spoils of war, right? The four kings beat the five kings, took Lot and his family. Abraham goes, ah, I don't think so. Gets together a band of 318 guys. You know, remember 300? <laughs> 318 guys. And it says that they slaughtered Keter Laamar. Now, Keter Laamar was Amraphel. Amraphel was the title of Nimrod. He, Amraphel is Nimrod. Uh, Joshua tells you that. And uh, Keter Laamar is like his general Patton. And Abraham and his boys utterly destroyed, slaughtered Keter Laamar, who was the leader of the armies that just wiped out five giant armies worth of you know, their enemies. Abraham and 300 guys. Now, Abraham had some interesting allies, though, Mamre, Aner, and Eshkel, who were, who were also giants, I believe. So that's rather interesting. Josephus just comes right out and tells you. If, you. if you're misunderstanding it just from reading the, the Genesis text, Josephus breaks it down and just tells you right point blank in antiquity of the Jews. It says, these kings laid waste to all Assyria and overthrown the offspring of the giants. He tells you point blank. This was a war against giants against giants. And put that a little bit in perspective, <laughs> you know. I believe this is something like what the Hebrew spies may have encountered when they, when they went into the land and they saw the giant, and they felt like grasshoppers. And I love Caleb. He's like, yeah, what's the problem? <laughs> says, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy, for we are well able to overcome it. <laughs> I'm like, dude. <laughs> you know, everybody gives the spies a bad rap, but I mean, come on. Now, to be fair, I understand why God got mad because God had just delivered him from Egypt and the pillar of fire and you know, all the split in the Red Sea and all of the stuff that God had already proved to them, hey, I'm with you. Don't worry about what you see. I'll take care of it. But if you're just a normal human guy and you see something like that, I can understand why people are like, whoa, die, 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 die. Yeah. So, uh, again, I like to put together timeline charts. I have these in the back if you want to check them out. Uh, the Genesis 14 came from this chart right here. But as I was looking through that research, I also noticed something interesting in the story where um, Sarah dies, right? Abraham had to bury his wife. It says he negotiates with an individual named Ephron of the Hittites. Several places it says that. Well, when you look into the Hittites, Hittites are among the group of people that God says utterly destroy. Mm -hmm. So we know they're Nephilim. The Hittites have many different carvings and depictions of animal human hybrids. You got a satyr dude right here, two of them, and you got lion men. Human body lion head. The scripture talks about them fighting against lion men of Moab. You know? So I mean you got to if you if you if you kind of know what to look for, you'll start seeing lots of wild stuff in your scriptures. And when you look up Ephron's name in that book, J.B. Jackson's book, Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names, Ephron's name means fawn like. The Hittites name me, they're, they're the terrors. The terrors draw, have depictions of satyrs. Makes you wonder. I can't say this for a fact, but it makes you wonder. Was Ephron a satyr? I'm just putting it out there. And if you read the book of Joshua, you'll see that there's an account. Uh, I think the prophet's name was Zepho or something. I think it was a descendant of Esau. He's going out trying to find his donkey, and he hears a noise. He goes into a cave, and it describes a person that from the waist down was a goat, and from the waist up was a human. That's messed with it, so he kills it. But it's just, it, when you read it, it's just written matter of fact. It's like, yeah, I killed a horse, you know? Yeah. You know, to us, we're like, what? <laughs> but to them, it's like, yeah, you know, I killed a satyr, you know, or, or we just went to war against the lion men of Moab, you know? And if you look at the, the, the black obelisk of Shamanese the third, it shows the lion men. It shows these people who are taller than elephants walking these dudes that have lion bodies and human heads. And Shalmaneser, King Shalmaneser, is, uh, is referred to in the book of either First or Second Kings, I believe. That stuff's in your scriptures, <laughs> if you know where to look. And again, the, the, 
the Nephilim that we find in the post world are Nephilim that came from other Nephilim. They're not Nephilim that came from angels. It says point blank in Numbers 13.33 that these were Nephilim that came from other Nephilim. These are the Anakim, who came from Anak, who came from Arba, who is an Amorite, son of Canaan, son of Ham, who stepped off the ark with no mention of angels. So, with all